presentation. I just remembered I have to record, so please forgive me. Um, so we are recording this um, tonight. Um, so if you don't want your face or name appearing on anything, you can change all that now in your settings. Um, so Reef Check Australia is um, a citizen science organisation. And we have two just sort of different teams of people. We have um, uh, ambassadors who attend our events, etc. And then we also have our survey divers who undertake some more detailed training um, they're normally highly skilled divers, and then they go out and survey the health of our coral reefs. Um, okay, so a little bit of housekeeping. As I said, if we can get everyone to keep their, um, their microphone muted and their videos off, because um, Christine does have some videos to run. So if we keep all that turned off, it just helps with bandwidth and they will work a little bit better. Uh, if you would like to get our monthly newsletters, uh, just shoot an email to myself at acqsurveys at reefcheckaustralia.org and I can add you to our mailing list. If you've got any questions as we go, you can put them in the chat box and um, we will ask all the questions at the end because what we find is if you ask the questions as we go, the speaker will often answer that question anyway in the next slide. So we'll do all the questions at the end, but please feel free to put them in the chat as we go. And then um, we might do a group photo if Erlen can still manage to do that, even though he can't speak to us. Um, so as I say, if you want to change your name or turn your um, video off, you can. But um, otherwise, if everyone has their video on and wants to smile, and Erlen will take that screen down and will take a photo for us. Okay, we'll do um, our upcoming events first. So we've got the Griffith University Careers Fair, and that's on the 30th of August from 11 till 2. If anyone wants to know how to get uh, into marine science, or any other science degree for that matter. Um, Kids in Action, this is run by the Sunshine Coast Council. And the aim of that is to teach children how to become um, advocates for the environment by planning and undertaking projects. So they have two different um, events happening. They have a projects day on May the 6th and then a conference on September the 9th of September. Um, it's aimed towards kids in years five to eight. Um, but if you jump on the Sunshine Coast Council website, you can get some more information about that. And next month's event is, can't even say this, Ecological Stoichiometry of Coral Larvae by Dr. Natalie um, from the University of Queensland. Um, I'm not exactly sure at this stage what it's about, but I'm sure it's going to be really interesting. So we'll send out some more information about that as, we, as it comes to hand. Um, there are, as I say, ways you can become involved. You can become an ambassador if you're not a scuba diver. And we run ambassador courses throughout the year. You can just send an email to myself at SEQ Surveys or jump on the website to get that email address. And we can put you on the list and let you know when the next course is coming up. And then for certified scuba divers, we run survey um, diver training courses. So, and once again, you can just email me and I can um, put your name on the list and all the information on what's required in terms of prerequisites are on the website. And then of course, follow us all on socials or sign up for that newsletter. And we have to thank our sponsors um, without whom these things wouldn't be possible. And that's Sunshine Coast Council, Townsville Council, City of Gold Coast and the Port of Brisbane. And we do have a team, although we're quite small tonight, um, behind these events. So um, it takes, takes all the team to make them happen. And as you can see, we're working as a team tonight because I'm doing the talking and Erlen's doing the uh, presenting. <laughs> so tonight's speaker is Dr. Christine Dudgeon and she's from the University of Queensland and the University of Sunshine Coast. She's a busy lady. Um, and you've probably read all of that stuff anyway because it was on the calendar event. 
um, but she's going to fill us in on all the work she's doing with leopard sharks. And yes, I've just had a reminder about the photo. It's okay. <laughs> But Christine can tell you a bit more about herself. Oh, here we go. And so if you'd like to turn your video on and smile um, and forgive my flustered presentation because I wasn't expecting to actually present. <laughs> okay, where's all our smiling faces? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, we're good? Right, yeah, okay. All right, so we're all good now, Erlen? Yep, got our photo? Great. So if I'll get everyone now to turn their videos back off and um, I'll get Christine to share her screen and she can start with her presentation. Hi everyone, can you see my screen? I'll just um, double check before I launch into this. Yes, yeah, we've got that, thank you. Okay, lovely, thank you. Hi, thanks so much for coming. Um, my my screen is actually here, so I'm going to be a bit profiling the little insert box uh, while I'm looking at things. But um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to come and speak with you tonight. Uh, I'm a massive fan of leopard sharks and love talking about them, so this is a, a great joy. Um, and uh, yeah, so my name's Chris and I'm with uh, UQ and the University of the Sunshine Coast. Um, and I, I'll just, uh, I, I don't know many of you, I have seen a few familiar faces, so thank you for coming. Um, but I'll uh, just put myself into context for you. So um, like many marine scientists, I grew up inland and loved going to the beach uh for summer holidays and my uh, high school was in canberra so my local beach was down around the batemans bay area um and uh in southern new south wales and so the first elasma branks i got to know when i learned to dive were things like gray nurse sharks and port jackson sharks and the various things we call bull rays um, but i'm not particularly great in cold water so i decided to go and study um, undergraduate up at james cook university in townsville and at that time, there wasn't a lot of shark stuff going on up there. This changed. Uh, there was a bit of a pulse of shark research there much later. But at that time, um, my focus was very much coral reef fish and corals. And the first animal I ever tagged was a, um, a carpet python. So um, this is a, a little bit different from that. And uh, during that time, too, I started working a lot with DNA and the use of DNA to study ecology and evolution in animals. And, and that's one of the tools I still use a fair bit. But I still wanted to work on sharks. And a friend of mine came to Brisbane to start his PhD on humpback whale song. And he saw a project advertise on leopard sharks. And he contacted me and said, you know, Chris, I think this is something you would like. And it looked great and uh, lots of field work. And so I applied and I got the position to start my PhD. And um, then I was a bit worried because I'd never even seen one of these things in the wild, um, just an aquarium. I really didn't know anything about them, but I was in good company because actually nobody really knew anything about them. So this was a, a classic blank slate project where the species really hadn't been studied in the wild. So everything that we were finding was exciting. Um, and uh, so that was 18 years ago and still working on them and still finding new and very exciting things. Um, so tonight, I really am happy to, to go through some of a bit about the species, a bit about what we've learned over that time and the current uh, um, directions that we're working with them. So just to uh, start with, I mean, pull it up. can I change my slide? So hopefully you can see this video and hopefully some of you have had this experience here um, in uh, subtropical Eastern Australia. So this video is actually from Byron Bay Marine Park um, from Dr. David Robinson, who owns Sundive there. And this is an exceptional uh, sort of dive when you get to see this many leopard sharks in the water um, at one time. Um, but this really is something that is unique to our part of the world. So Southern Queensland, Northern New South Wales, um, to see this sort of aggregation, you really don't get it anywhere else. 
Um, it's really special and we're super lucky. So I'm just going to start with some fairly go back to basics and just talk about what is a leopard shark. So um, this is a leopard shark. So this is what we call an Indo-Pacific leopard shark. And you can see hopefully in the map that uh, the distribution in orangey yellow, it's in the Western Pacific and Indian Ocean around coastal waters, subtropical and tropical regions. And so our animal here, Stegostoma tigranum, um, this is a, an adult, this animal, she's about a bit over two meters in long and she had a, has her adult patterns. She's got these nice ridges that run along the side here. And she's got this other thing, which is a really long single lobe tail. So single lobes, good for animals that spend time on the bottom as opposed to a fork tail where you have two lobes sort of in a, a V shape, which you find in things like tuna or other fish that are fast swimming. Now, common names are confusing because they're common and they're just names that people say from areas that they see animals. And there is another thing called a leopard shark. And that animal is over in the Eastern Pacific Ocean off the coast of California and Mexico. And that's this animal here. It's a dogfish, which is a completely different kind of shark, much smaller and he reaches around a bit over a meter in length. So these animals are both called leopard sharks. Um, this one, this American one probably was called that first, we're not really sure, but they don't occur together in the wild. They only co-occur if they do in Aquaria sometimes. But it's because that there is this other thing called a leopard shark that ours is sometimes called a zebra shark. And that is because of this. So this is a new hatching, um, tiny little thing, only about 20 centimeters long came out of one of these eggs. And you can see these bold black and white markings. And that's where the zebra bit comes from. But the thing is, they don't stay like this for very long. And we very, very rarely ever see them in the wild like that. So we don't um, tend to, doesn't make much sense to call them a zebra shark. So we're still going to go with leopard shark. I'm just putting a little cross here to illustrate which one we're talking about. Um, and actually where these animals are seen in the wild, um, people do tend to call them leopard sharks, but that's in English. So in other languages, for example, Thai, the name is Chalam Sui Dal, which means starry shark. In Bahasa Indonesian, it's uh, Hugh Bilimbing, which means star fruit shark. So there's other types of common names too. Um, I like to propose the idea, we start calling them jaguar sharks. So if you're familiar with the life aquatic, you might get that, but uh, you know, some of them are pretty jaguar-y and that name, that common name's not taken yet. So we could, we could migrate to that. Um, leopard sharks, our leopard sharks are taxonomically unique. So what does that mean? They're the only species in their family. So to put the family into context for you, the dolphin family, the Delphinidae is comprised of upwards of 40 different species of dolphins, which range from the little Hector and Maui dolphins that are a meter long up to the orca, which is nine meters long, the killer whales. They're all part of the dolphin family. Leopard sharks are it. They're the only one. We have to go up a level of taxonomy to the order of carpet sharks. And this is the other families that are in there. So we have the whale shark. So they're the only species in their family too. And once upon a time, leopard sharks and whale sharks were actually combined in a single family. And that's because they do share some features. So they have ridges. The whale sharks have ridges as well, but the leopard sharks have. But otherwise they're pretty different. Um, for many other reasons. Um, the other families in this group include wobbegongs, the epaulets, there's actually nine species, not eight of those, the bamboo sharks and nose sharks. So these are all the relatives of leopard sharks, but none of them are really close relatives. So um, if we got rid of leopard sharks, there's nothing there that will just come in and, you know, sort of replace them. Uh, they are egg layers and they lay the largest eggs um, and the, the largest of the egg laying sharks. Uh, this is a picture of an egg taken from the waters off PP Island and the egg has long hairs down one side of it and that attaches to these, um, in this case it's a Gorgonian coral, but uh, I do know of eggs being found attached to channel markers, for example. We don't really know a lot about where they lay eggs, but it tends to be fairly close inshore in shallow areas. 
when they hatch, they come out as these gorgeous little stripy um, 20 centimeter odd animals. And um, a friend of mine, uh, Will White, based at CSIRO in Tassie, uh, he was looking at this picture of a juvenile leopard shark swimming on the surface and its zebra form and thought that it quite resembled a sea snake. And so we explored the idea that maybe they are striped like this because they mimic sea snakes and that would be advantageous for them because um, this is the most vulnerable stage in the shark's life is when they're a little newborn or a little hatchling. Uh, and so we explored this idea. Um, and so the, the type of mimicry this is, if you mimic something that's dangerous, it's called baiting mimicry. And there's all sorts of criteria and it may, meets quite a lot of it, but just looking at the animal, um, you know, it's stripy, but also there's a very long tail, the way that they swim, it's very undulating. Uh, they spend a fair bit of time on the surface. They still swim on the surface as adults. Um, so lots of, and then they start to lose that stripy pattern once they outgrow the sea snake model. So it was just a theory, but an interesting one. What do they eat? Well, here is the mouth of death for you. Um, clearly not that terrifying. They have really, really small, but very sharp teeth. Lots of them all sort of compiled together and they've got quite a strong crunchy mouth. So they eat things like snails and crabs, but we just did some diet analysis um, and we found that they were eating things like dragonets, um, small benthic fish that bury in the sand, as well as flatheads. So we'll be doing some more work in that space. Um, one of the things about the teeth, just to mention, is that for sharks, they don't have bone. So the teeth are what we find in the fossil record uh, as far as being able to go back and, and sort of uncover their evolutionary history. So something like a leopard shark, whether it's the same genus or a different genus, has been around for about 20 million years. So, um, you know, it's quite, quite a well-established species. And that's just from the teeth. What eats them? Well, um, juvenile, probably anything that can uh, fit that little shark in its mouth would eat it. As adults, they tend to be pretty good at avoiding being predated. This one, unfortunately, seemed to have had a bit of a tussle with some other type of shark. So possibly a bull shark. This is off Minjerabar Strati. So um, there's plenty of bull sharks around there. So this is off the point. Uh, and so this animal, she's fine. She was just um, lying on the ground and I rolled her over. So you can possibly see here, I'm holding the end of the tail. And uh, one of the interesting things about this species is that they have a bit of a strange um, response for tonic immobility, where some sharks, if you flip them upside down or touch their nose, they go into tonic. With leopard sharks, if you grab the very end of the tail, they go all floppy. And this is how they mate. So the male will come up and bite the end of the tail to, to basically restrain the female for mating. And we use this to be able to roll them over, take them to the surface. Um, and in this case, so she was just sitting on the bottom and I rolled her over and she's quite happily done that, um, not complaining. But you can see this big shark bite underneath uh, and it looks like something's come up and bitten her from underneath. And I, I think probably a bull shark and because they do spend a fair bit of time swimming on the surface. I'll just put a disclaimer in there. We do have ethics and permits for doing this handling and we handle them for reasons, so not just for fun. So one of the questions for my PhD is we've I've moved here, um, down here, um, I live in Brisbane, um, you know, to work off Minjeraba, off the point where we know these animals are, and we want to find out how many there are. So understanding the size of the population is really important for all sorts of reasons, including conservation. Um, and we just had no idea, um, you know, basically. There had been a student before me who tagged four animals back in 1999. Um, so we knew there were at least four. That was basically where we were at with that. So this is um, the most unpleasant slide I'll show you, and I do apologize, but here's one of the reasons why we need to know um, how many there are. So. Uh, back in 2015, leopard sharks were reassessed on the IUCN red list and they have been reassessed as endangered. Um, and this is because there is considerable fishing 
uh, throughout a lot of their range. Now, we'll get to numbers in a moment, but you can just look at these pictures and see that there, there's a um, substantial number of individuals being fished out in each one of these photos. And these are all mature adults um, at this size. So um, this could potentially have a, a big impact on those populations. So to do um, some of these population estimates, we wanted to use a technique called photo identification. And um, I'm sure that many of you are really familiar with this. Uh, it's pretty common these days, but back in 2003, the jury was still out about, is this actually a valid technique? Um, and uh, one, one uh, project in particular, I remember at that time with the gray nurse sharks, there was a lot of controversy and conflicting ideas about whether you could you could use photo ID. Um, so we we basically needed to show that it was possible for these animals. And one of the reasons, uh, one of the things that we needed to say is that, well, can we tell individuals apart? Is there enough variation? And when you start to look at them, absolutely, they are hugely different to each other. These are extreme examples. Like so, sometimes some of them are fairly similar. But you can see here, these are all large animals and there's quite a variety of spotting patterns. So some of them just have little spots like this, this guy down here, super spotty, really fine. This one also has a bit of a funny looking dorsal fin. So that's quite useful for ID. Um, then you still have some of these beautiful horseshoe shapes where they follow the patterns of the juveniles. Um, biggest spots like this. And then you have some really quite stunning um, rosettes or floral patterns. So we're definitely able to tell them apart. Now, unlike manta rays, where you take a photo of the belly, these guys have two sides. So they have the left side and the right side. Now, if you see one like this, this floral, floral one that has that left side, um, it's also going to be florally on the other side. It's not going to look like this on the other side, but they're not perfectly identical. When we started doing this, a lot of it was done by eye. We now have automated software, um, which, which does it uh, since we've got slightly larger databases. Um, so we tend to take photos of the left side for consistency. So at the moment, um, during my PhD, when we did some population estimates, we we're estimating at about 500 of these large animals were coming and aggregating off-point lookout every year. So this is the manta bombing or the group off-point off lookout. Um, so if you think back to those photos, you know, that's, that's, and this is probably the sort of the size of the mating aggregation that we have in this part of the world. So if you think back to those photos of, of the, the numbers of animals that are being fished, um, that can be, you know, it's... Yeah, das mache ich. Ich höre mir jetzt noch ein uh, Zoom meeting an über leopard sharks. Okay. All right. I'll unmute. Um, there we go. Uh, so, um, but at the moment, so what we do know for these animals, uh, we have currently 698 individuals identified from the east coast of Australia. So um, David Robinson at Sundive started the Cape Byron Leopard Shark project. And uh, um, we've been working with him to upload uh, all the photos from the East Coast database going back um, onto this uh, now global database, which is the Wild Book for Sharks. So if you have pictures that you would like um, to contribute to Leopard Shark ID, then please um, have a look at this database and you can register and upload your own um, photos. Uh, if you find it a bit complicated or annoying, you can always get in touch with us um, and we can help you to do that. But we are sort of really starting to build this database, which is which is fantastic. Um, and also there's uh, studies going on elsewhere, um, Thailand. I see Rees online from WA. She's been driving a lot of the work over there, um, Mozambique and, and other places. So the other question, um, which is which is something we needed to address particularly for this species, is how stable are those patterns over time? And if you look at this, remembering that they start off as these really uh, 
very, very different looking animals. In fact, this species has one of the biggest changes between you know, um, juveniles and adults in patterns that we have in any shark species. Um, so these start to break up and, and these are photos from the aquarium where we were following individuals. And you can see that by the time it's 14 months old and about a meter long, those stripes are gone and it's entirely spotty. Um, but these still keep changing. And so these change until they reach their adult sizes, which they reach that sort of two upwards of two meters by the time they're over two years of age. But they don't actually mature until they're six or seven years of age. So we don't know when in that space that those patterns stabilize. But we do have a little bit of information from the wild and I'll show you this guy. So this is uh, affectionately known as Derek. Um, and he was named after the student that put those four fin tags in back in 1999. And I first saw him in 2003. And he's got this, this clump here is that's algae growing on that fin tag. Um, and we were able to photograph him back then. We've seen him multiple times since then. And last year we caught him as part of a tagging program. And uh, we were able to match him using that automated software um, between 2021 and previous times. And you can see that his fin has healed quite nicely as well. So there's a little bit of a notch there um, from that tag migrating its way out. But this animal, um, we, we show here that the photo matching works over 18 years. Now, in last year when we when we caught Derek, we, we caught 20 sharks in total and eight of those have matched from our database from between 2003 and 2005. So certainly for these larger mature animals that the, the patterns are really stable. Um, Derek was tagged as a large mature animal as well. Um, and so given maturity is six to seven years of age, we estimate that at a minimum, he would be 30 years old. Um, that's the record for this species in the wild. In captivity, the oldest animal um, who died a few years ago, Leo, he was at least 40 years old. So we don't know how old they get. That's a minimum that we know. Of. So um, much like manta rays, that they have a white morph and the melanistic morph, um, leopard sharks have two morphs as well. And on the East Coast, we don't really see this other morph, but this is a photo from Ningaloo Reef. And you can see here is one of our sort of regular looking yellow um, leopard sharks. But this guy up the top here is what's known as the sandy morph. Um, very, very pale. And sometimes you can see like this picture down here, uh, you know, when, you, when something like this swims past, it almost looks more like a, a a tawny nurse shark or a bamboo shark, not a leopard shark, but you can tell from the actual body shape and the ridges that it is in fact a leopard shark. Um, the interesting thing is this is a juvenile. So the juveniles are not that bold stripey that we saw with the yellow form. They're actually almost like a giraffe and they have these very fine reticulated patterns and that breaks up um, until it reaches this really plain sandy morph. Um, this research group, they're a Danish group, um, Dahl and colleagues. So they actually, they described this sandy morph from samples that they obtained in Kenya. And uh, I received this paper to review and they were saying, oh, this is very unusual. We only find it in Kenya. And I said, no, you don't. We actually have it in Ningaloo Reef. Um, and also there are other records of it from India. So it seems to be more in the Indian Ocean. I've never seen it on the East Coast. I'd be curious if anyone else has. Um, and I do know of one record from um, the East Indonesian area, but it's certainly nowhere near as common as the yellow form. Genetically, they're the same species. So it's definitely a, just a different morph, not a different species. And I just wanted to point out the, um, the species name here for a moment, because some of you might be familiar with this species as Stegosoma fasciatum or Stegosoma varium, which sometimes turns up. Um, so when Dahl um, and colleagues were doing this work, they were going back through the history of the species for Stegosoma. Uh, and what happens is that you sometimes have 
different research groups naming the same animal different things because maybe they're at different parts of the world and this is pre-internet or maybe one group has, has actually described the juvenile and the others described the adult and they don't know about it. Um, so that's why there's so many different names for the same species, including the scientific name. So the one that is the correct scientific name is whichever one was described earliest, but followed all the um, binomial nomenclature rules. So there's lots of you know, strict rules about how you name things. Um, and so when Dahl and, and this group were doing the research, they discovered that um, actually the species name, uh, the, the first one that had was valid um, description was Stegostoma tigridum, which of course means tiger shark. Um, again, confusing, but uh, that's that's why if you're ever curious as to why a species name changed, it was just that they realized there was a precursor that was actually valid. Um, and given that that's how it works, um, it was changed to follow that. So the second um, area I'm just going to talk about a little bit is the movement ecology. So we knew that these animals were off Minjaraba. We'd see them over the summer months. We wouldn't see them all year round. Um, and so it was evident that they were going elsewhere. Um, and why are they moving? And so photo ID or dive surveys are great when the animals are there, they're not particularly useful um, when the animals aren't there uh, to be able to find out where they go. And so we um, use a technique called acoustic telemetry. So tracking. Now, this is a little bit of a busy slide, so I'm just gonna walk you through it. So over here, we have our telemetry system. So this is a receiver. This goes in the water and stays underneath the water. That's a hydrophone. That is like a microphone underwater. It picks up the signal of the tag. And then inside here, we have a battery pack and a computer. Down here, this person's holding a bunch of different acoustic tags. So these tags are coded so that it, it has a signal for an individual fish or animal, whatever it's attached to. And it just sends out a signal um, with a determined frequency. So if we've got an animal that's hanging around a bit, it's not moving too fast, we might um, set it up so that this tag pings every two minutes or so. So basically when the animal is within 500 meters of this receiver, it will detect that, that ping. And it's a very high frequency ping, we can't hear it. Um, depending on your animal, there is the a tag might go you might attach it to the outside. Um, in this study, we uh, surgically inserted the tags inside the leopard shark so that they stay in there. Um, this study went for four years. Uh, just last year, we, we deployed another 20 tags and those ones will last for 10 years. Um, if we put them outside the shark, they'll get fouled. They'll get covered in all sorts of um, algae and barnacles and, and cause problems to that animal. But so far, all of the evidence from long-term tagging has shown that they essentially go into the body cavity, they get sort of surrounded by scar tissue and the animal survives and carries on um, perfectly fine. So we tagged um, 18 sharks in this study here off um, Point Lookout. So that's the black circle. And the other shapes indicate locations where there were receivers in the water. Now, um, Along here, each line, it starts in February, 2012, each line represents one shark. Okay, so it's one through to 18. And a, and a symbol represents a detection on a day at that location. So these animals were all tagged off point lookout. We can see all the first um, symbols represent black. So that's that point lookout. And then as we progress across an animal, we can see what it's done. So. Um, I'm not sure if you can see the, the shading, it's quite light, but basically uh, it's sort of shaded between November and May, indicating that warmer summer to April, um, autumn part time of the year. So what we're finding is that during that time of the year, the animals are around coming back to Minjeriba and then they're also heading south. Um, and then during the colder period, they're coming back up and starting to head north. 
Um, and so they're really mostly moving around this sort of thousand kilometer section of coastline. And their movements seem to be quite strongly associated with that East Australia current and in particular, 22 degree threshold. So as that water is sort of pushing further south, the animals will move further south with it. We did get some pretty interesting things. So here, these white triangles show that the leopards came into Morton Bay a little bit, um, mostly on the eastern side. Uh, this one is up here is a particularly interesting movement. So this animal, she was tagged um, off Minjeriba, then she was picked up off Orpheus Island up here, off Townsville, and then turned back up at Minjeriba and then further south a bit. And then we can see sort of some hits further along. So she moved like over two and a half thousand kilometers in six months. Um, people think that they're pretty sluggish and they do tend to not move very quickly, but that's a big swim for a shark like this. Uh, the other one that's of real interest is here, this one here. So you can see these diamonds. So this animal, she was tagged off Minjeriba and then she was picked up off Heron Island. And then here, she spent like a couple of months in the Gladstone Harbour. And I suspect that she was laying eggs here. So we think this could be a really important juvenile nursery area for them. So we're starting round, um, a next round of this long-term tagging, as I mentioned. We caught 20 animals um, last November. This is Cam Cotterell from um, Morton Bay Research Station. Uh, pulling up one of the leopard sharks using our tail grabbing technique. And the reason that we're doing this is several um, reasons for it. But one, one of the things is, is that our acoustic telemetry array in Queensland is extraordinary at the moment. It's the biggest array we've ever had. There's a massive um, project through the integrated marine observing system um, that has so all of these dots here, these blue dots and these red dots are all part of this acoustic telemetry array. And some of them represent ones that are maintained by IMOS and others are just independent research projects. But all of the equipment talks to each other. So if somebody uploads their receiver and it's picked up your animal, you get that data. So as you could see in that previous day, there's heaps of gaps where we have no idea where the animals are. So now is an excellent time to be tracking them to try and understand where they're moving and particularly things like where are they laying the eggs because we just simply don't know. Um, we're also taking blood samples so we can understand their reproduction um, better and their dietary analysis. This beast here is a leech. Um, this is by far the biggest leech I have ever seen on one of these animals and it was attached to its clasper which um, it was about as big as the clasper so I'm not sure um, I didn't talk about that for those of you who may not know much about um, shark reproduction, but males um, and females, you can tell them apart. So the males actually have claspers, which look like two penises, and they're an extension of those pelvic fins. Um, and they use those to, to um, penetrate the female, so they, they have sex. Um, and they're not... They're, Pretty much the same size as that. So I'm, uh, you know, this leech might have been getting in the way of um, this male attempting to reproduce. Uh, the other thing that's quite nice about this leech is that it is only ever this leech is specific to leopard sharks. You don't find this species on anything else, and it is the most beautiful leech um, that I've ever seen as far as colours go. You know, usually they're just sort of black and not very attractive. I know attractive leech is kind of a bit of a oxymoron but you know as far as leeches go this one's a winner um anyway so uh keep an eye out for them next time you're diving okay the last um bit of old research that i, I want to mention has to do with um genetics so we examined um the population genetics um of leopard sharks throughout their distribution so that we could actually understand that bigger scale, so uh, apart from just looking in, in Queensland. So this is work that was published back um, you know, over a decade ago. Now, I'm just going to explain this figure so you don't have to sort of think, look too much into it. But basically, these shapes, the circles and the squares, represent two different types of genetic markers. 
And um, what you can see is that there's, and this line that runs through here, essentially is splitting our globe of leopard sharks into two major populations. So there's one that falls to the west of this line. Um, our nuclear markers are all falling into this white group, if you will. And there's one that falls to the east of this line. Now, there's a bit of variation going on in between. So, you know, there's population structure in between, but at a global scale, we have two major groups. Um, this line here, um, some of you might be familiar with this part of the world. There's this uh, very strong current called the Indonesian through flow current that runs between the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean. Um, and if you've been diving um, off Bali and looking for Mola Mola, um, you might be familiar with that current, which uh, apparently is notorious for sort of pulling people down into the depths. Um, so this particular uh, barrier is also known as the Wallace Line. And um, Alfred Wallace was a contemporary of Charles Darwin. And while Darwin was over in the Galapagos looking at finches, Wallace was over here looking at things like where you find monkeys and where you find um, arboreal marsupials. So he, he basically was studying biogeography in this area. And he came up with the theory of natural selection at the same time as Darwin and he's credited for it, though not anywhere near as famous. Um, but this barrier seems to be quite important for marine animals as well, and certainly um, leopard sharks. Now, I, the reason I want to, to show you this and, and just stress it as well is just um, think about this area here, because we're going to talk about this area here um, shortly. So at the moment, um, I'm now going to diverge a little bit and talk about a current and exciting um, conservation project. Uh, and what I've just mentioned is relevant. So in case you are sort of wondering where she's going with this. And so this is the overall umbrella program is called ReShark. And as it says here, it's an international collective effort to recover threatened sharks and rays around the world. Um, and you can see there's quite a few, um, and these are the main partners involved. I forgot to put university, um, logos from my own universities on there, but um, there's lots of different um, people. It's, it's quite a large collaboration. So just to give you a bit of background on this, um, there is an impetus for zoos and aquaria to move away from being just entertainment facilities and have a greater active role in conservation. And there's many ways that they can do this, but one of the ways um, that there's interest in is what's known as ex situ breeding programs. And that essentially means that you take captive bred animals and release them into the wild to replenish depleted populations. And there's a fair bit of this has happened on land. So things like the Przewalski's horse that was extinct in Mongolia, it's been reintroduced. California condors, similar story. This uh, little cute mouse here um, has been extinct for New South Wales. So this is a very new program that's happening. But there's very little of this in the ocean, um, particularly with vertebrate animals. And so given that many sharks and rays are threatened, in fact, like over a third of the species um, fall under a threat categories on IUCN red list, and they also, a lot of them don't show signs of recovery with respect to other types of conservation. Um, there's an interest in whether ex situ breeding could work. And um, leopard sharks are the first species of interest for this program. Um, back in 2015, when I was doing the IUCN red list assessment for this species, it sort of came to the attention of a lot of people that leopard sharks are really highly threatened in many parts of their distribution and it's sort of gone unnoticed for quite some time um, partly because they do well in captivity a lot of aquaria around the world have leopard sharks so they sort of didn't notice that they weren't there in the wild anymore and so um, the, a lot of discussions started happening around is it possible to have an ex situ breeding program with these animals um, and so 
those were two criteria to begin with, the fact that they are threatened in the wild, but do well in captivity. Um, another reason that they were of interest is because they're egg layers um, and shipping eggs around is actually a lot easier than shipping juveniles. So it's thought that, you know, the animal themselves could do with some conservation effort, but also they could provide a good model for other shark and ray systems. So there was a big workshop held in um, Georgia Aquarium in the USA back in 2019, and lots of discussions around, you know, is this type of program worth it? You know, should we bother? Um, is it, or just leave it to its own devices, which, to be honest, leaving to its own devices, that ship has already sailed because we've already fiddled in the system. Um, and so the idea is, yes, there's a lot of benefits from this. Um, and so uh, uh, beneath the reshark, um, leopard shark specific program for this was invented or designed called the STAR project, which stands for Stegostoma Tigranum Augmentation and Reinforcement Project, which just rolls off the tongue. But I quite like the star bit, particularly coming back to the um, Asian common names for leopard sharks being starry shark and starfruit shark. So um, we don't need to do, do this in Australia. Our sharks are pretty good. Uh, we have fairly healthy populations. There's very little in the way of fishing. Um, they do well if they're caught on shark control or bycatch and uh, have quite high survivability if they're released. But so the question was, well, where would be um, the place to do this? And the proposal was for uh, Raja Ampat in West Papua province, East Indonesia. So remembering back to that map with the genetic population structure, here we are. There's our Wallace line coming through here. So Raja Ampat was proposed for a few reasons. Firstly, um, this was one location where it became evident that leopard sharks had largely disappeared and they used to be there in big numbers. Um, the second thing is that it has an extensive marine protected area network. There's no point releasing animals back into the wild if they're just gonna get fished out again. So it's extensive and it's well enforced. Um, the other thing is that there is a, an ongoing research program or um, I would say collection of research programs in the area uh, connected to these MPAs as well. Um, so there's a lot of infrastructure uh, already there, uh, good relationships with communities, good relationships with the local and regional government and the ecotourism areas. So there's a lot of support and interest for a project like this. These two stars here, this is Wyag, um, Papua Diving in Wyag, and this is Masul Eco Resort in Masul. So both of these resorts came on board the project as hatchery and um, juvenile release sites. Uh, so super important to have that support and interest in the area. So um, the trickier thing was getting the support from the Indonesian federal government. So they were particularly concerned about, um, firstly, one of the questions that they asked was, is it, is it needed? What if we just leave it? Like, can those animals recover? And so we had actually done some um, demographic modeling with the IUCN Conservation um, Specialist Planning Group. And that modeling essentially predicts what happens in the future um, based on the life history characteristics of the, of the animal. And so if we say, okay, if we just leave it, you know, based on the numbers that are likely to be there, will it recover? And the answer is yes, but it might take hundreds of years and it may not be successful and there's a really high risk of extinction. Where on the other hand, if we aid this population with releasing animals into the wild, will that help? Um, and so we have pretty good models to suggest that, um, you know, if we released so many, so there were different scenarios and different numbers of animals being released, how, how that would help. So the government was quite happy with that. The second thing that they were concerned about was genetic pollution. And so the question was, well, where are the animals coming from? And so if we just go back to this slide for a moment, um, given that Raja Ampat's in this part of the world, uh, basically we said, well, the, we would be aiming for animals that originate from this Eastern population. 
And part of the work that we've been doing over the last couple of years is screening all of the potential breeders in aquaria around the world. So these animals are in the USA, Australia, um, Asia, Europe, and testing what their genetic origins are. And so it quite cleanly falls out that they either fall out to be on the west or the east population. And in the cases where it's a, it's a bit ambiguous, it tends to be because those animals were born in captivity to parents of mixed stock. So we could go back and check if there was known pedigree of those animals. Now, a lot of the animals in this eastern population actually originate from far north Queensland. Um, Cairns Marine is a aquarium collector. It's a sustainable fishery that removes aquarium fish out of the wild and ships them around the world. So um, we, we know of those animals that uh, have originated from there. Um, and so that's, you know, it'd probably be better to have animals closer, but they just don't exist, um, basically. So so a lot of them are coming from, from this location originally. The other issue that we had was that, you know, in Aquaria, often animals are quite closely related. So we needed to make sure that we weren't encouraging, um, you know, relatives to be breeding. And the other um, the other issue I just mentioned briefly is parthenogenesis. So leopard sharks are one of 10 species that have been shown uh, to reproduce um, unaided by a male. So this is parthenogenesis means virgin birth. So one of 10 shark and ray species, I should say. And in most cases, this has occurred when the females are in captivity and they don't have access to a male. Um, but in this case, what we found by screening these, um, the pups that are coming um, that from potential breeding pairs where we have a male and a female in captivity together uh, that are mating and then there's eggs being produced, that in some cases, those eggs are still parthenogenetically produced. They're not sexually produced. So this has raised all sorts of interesting questions as to why that happens. Um, do we know enough about the sexual um, cycles of these animals? Um, so lots of stuff that we're looking into. But um, and uh, just to explain the parthenogenesis, if you haven't heard of it before, essentially what happens is that the female, when she produces the egg, Rather than that egg cell, so not the egg, not that whole egg, but the egg cell, rather than that egg cell fertilizing together with a sperm to make an embryo, somehow the egg cell just duplicates its own DNA. So it doesn't have, it's not a clone of the mum, it only has half of her genetic diversity. So when we're trying to replenish a population, um, you know, we don't want to just be sending over these animals that only have half of the genetic diversity of a sexually produced adult. Plus their survival is probably not going to be as good if they have any bad genes that get expressed um, later on in life. So where are we up now with this? So right now, um, this is one of the, uh, the, the hatcheries in, um, in Wyag. And this little video down the bottom is a, uh, these people are actually taking the tanks across the water to, to take it to this hatchery site. So right now, as in today, the first eggs have ar are arriving in West Papua. So they've been stuck in, um, in the customs in uh, Jakarta for several days. So the team over there has been working really hard to uh, get that all sorted. There's a lot of bureaucracy with this project. Um, this woman here in the middle, I just want to flag her. That's Nesha Shida. She's amazing. She's our um, main on the ground person in Indonesia who's been doing a lot of um, the negotiations over there and really running things. Without her, the project wouldn't happen. Um, these guys are the shark nannies. So they came to, um, they, they're, they're from West Papua, um, I should say, these, these four here. So um, these guys here are the aquarists at Jakarta Aquarium, but the, the shark nannies are the aquarists who've gone to West um, to the Jakarta Aquarium and been trained in how to raise the animals and um, do that rearing. So the first location that's sent, at, sent the eggs to um, Raja Ampat is Sea Life in Sydney. So they have a breeding pair that was um, ready to go and whose eggs are viable and 
um, not parthenogenetic. And so that, uh, yeah, so basically it's just all fingers crossed and, you know, holding breath at the moment to see how things pan out for this first shipment. Um, but the next parts of this project essentially are to identify other locations for leopard shark program. Um, particularly a lot of the Asian uh, aquaria have animals that do not originate from the correct location, but they're super keen to be involved in something like this. So we need to find a Western site that would be appropriate. And there's also interest in what is the next species that can um, that can be targeted and, and possibly will not be an egg layer, but something that is more of a live birth animal. And so I've just got a many thanks. I dug into the archives to pull out some photos um, of people from the past, uh, as well as, as now. And um, uh, when I've said we, it means a lot of people. This is just a snapshot of a few. Um, this research has been you know, hugely collaborative, lots of collaborators, lots of volunteers, and um, you know, all the people doing the work everywhere and submitting their photos and stuff. So thank you very much. Please keep it up. Um, it's fantastic. And I'm happy to answer whatever questions you may have. Wow. Thanks, Chris. That's pretty awesome. Um, I actually thought that leech was a sea cucumber, but oh. okay. um, so I do have a couple of questions here and I'm sure we'll get some more. So Tash wants to know if they're opportunistic feeders or do they follow up? a feeding pattern? Uh, great question. We don't know. Um, we really don't know a lot about what they eat in the wild. Um, and um, mostly when we see them, they're not feeding. So um, the diet stuff we know mainly from metabarcoding. So it's sort of doing a, a COVID test up the rear end, if you will, and sending it off for DNA analysis. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, what, when we see them, so when we see them off strati, they tend to be sitting on the bottom. When we see them off Julian rocks, they tend to be swimming around in the water column um, and they're quite receptive to the tail grab. So we do suspect that they're more interested in mating at that time, um, but what they would be, and, and they're possibly not feeding where we're seeing them, but heading off, um, heading out. So yeah, lots of info there that just complete gaps of knowledge that we still don't know. Right. Um, Julian um, has asked, what about Stegostoma fasciatum? How different is it from yes, Tigrinum? Oh, it's the same it? thing. It's the same thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so Julian, uh, so what I was saying was that when the when the researchers did the work to Describe that sandy morph, they realized that it um, that there was actually a valid species name of Stegostomus tigrinum that predated Stegostoma fasciatum. So there is only one species of Stegostoma, ex, um, existing species, and there's only one species of Stegostomata day of the family. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Great. Um, gosh. Laurie said, thank you very much. Jacinta said it was so interesting. Tagging information is really interesting. Um, Marie has asked, did you do many dives out from Townsville? Uh, she went to James Cook to do honours and she saw quite a few of them off Magnetic Island. Oh, great. Um, yeah, I did a bit, but no, I, I never saw them off there. So probably didn't dive as much as you did then. So. <laughs> That's good to know. Um, whereabouts? Because we're actually quite interested in, we're, we're, we're starting to do more work in North Queensland. So um, we, we're really keen on finding locations where we would be able to tag them. We, we have a acoustically tagged one off um, with Sundays now, but uh, it's actually quite difficult to find them consistently in North Queensland. So if anybody knows um, places where you yeah, think you would find them. Okay. You might answer that to us. Um, Dominic would like to know how long the tail can get. Oh, yeah, good question. So the tail is almost as long as the rest of the body. So if you've got a two metre animal, the tail would probably be like 90 centimetres long. It's really long. The only other shark whose tail to body ratio is longer is a thresher shark. 
And the thresher shark, it's a very different type of shark because the tail is used for whacking through schools of fish. And they do have a little fork tail, but they're, so their tail's used for hunting. And we don't think that the leopard shark uses the tail for hunting. So it's, um, it's a really unusual, unusually long tail. That's why we think that it might have something to do with pretending to be a sea snake. Um, Terry's a little overawed by the amount of research presented, what we still do not know. <laughs> it's just one species. Um, Liz has said it's very true. Thank you. Um, Karen was wondering if Julian rocks and manta are the only spots they gather in numbers and, and why I think that may be. So then it's not, so that it, it, they're probably the, between those two as well. So off the Gold Coast, like Nine Mile and um, Fido's Reef and that area. So I've heard um, reports that the animals are, are gathering there too. So I do think that this little patch is an area where we find them in these sorts of numbers. Um, possibly because we don't, we don't have a lot of shallow reef, rocky reef like this. Um, you know, that it's not as extensive, like you get to the Great Barrier Reef and it, you know, it's just so much habitat. So the continental shelf here is quite narrow and it does start to get a bit deeper as you go out. Um, the other thing might be too, I, I don't know if anyone's ever seen trawling um, maps, but the, our coastline is heavily trawled. So we have these few patches of rocky reef where the habitat is pretty undisturbed, but a lot of that deeper habitat between us and the continental shelf is really, really heavily trawled. So it's probably a lot of that habitat is disturbed and damaged. Um, I know that they see them, so I'm gonna throw it over. She's still on. Re, how many would you have seen at once in WA? Maybe she's not on anymore. Oh no, she's No, not. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Great talk, by the way. Um, Thank you. I think the most I have recorded from a sighting, like a, from the citizen science database is six, um, but I didn't get any photographic evidence of that. So as far as photo wise, only three, but I've heard six. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think the most I know of an, in a single sighting from say Thailand would be about five. So that, yeah, similar. So yeah, I, I, I don't know why we have them in such big numbers over here. It's, it's extraordinary and it is still a big mystery. Um, we do think that they are, there's, we're doing more um, sort of high um, uh, next generation sequencing work. So some more high resolution genetics which, that do show that there is a, there is genetic, um, connection with North Queensland, but there's also seems to be some differences. So we're really still teasing all of that apart. That's um that's current work at the moment. I'll um, keep you posted. Okay, so Marie said that was off Nelly Bay, but it was back in 2000. Okay, yeah. Maybe not there still. Mm. Mm, maybe not. Um, Stephen has asked if the pathogenic offspring have only half of the mother's DNA, what's the other half? <laughs> Oh, super question. So the thing is that basically, and I'll try and explain this in words. So, so you essentially when the when you have um, gametogenesis, so when that egg cell is produced, what happens is that you have a cell and it, it sort of doubles and then it splits and it splits. So you get an egg cell, which is the cell that has all the good stuff, right? So the egg's much bigger than the sperm, right? So you get the cell, it's got the DNA, but it's got all the good stuff. But you also, they also produce other cells that still have DNA because you're starting with a full complement of DNA and then splitting it. So there's the other cells that have the DNA. So the, the thought is that the egg cell combines with one of the other cells that the mum has produced herself. And so the DNA is actually just duplicated. So it might have a, a you know two chromosome copies, but they're identical. And, the, and essentially, um, this, this makes it very easy for us to tell by screening the genetics that it is a parthenogenetic offspring and it's not sexually produced. 
but the actual mechanism of how it does that, we don't know. I wow. hope that answered it. <laughs> um, Marie has asked if they are caught because they are placid. Yeah, they, they are beautifully placid. Um, pros, pub, blah, blah, probably. Um, I would never grab the tail of a wobbygong. Please don't do that. <laughs> but it will not turn out to be the same thing. But it is very much a mating thing. So um, we've got, you know, photographic records and I've, I've not seen mating occur um, at these sites, but I've seen pre-copulatory following where the male will follow the female really closely. And I've seen videos taken from Aquaria where the female will be swimming, the male comes along, he just chomps the end of the tail and then they just both sink to the to the bottom. The, the other thing is that we've noticed that further along in the season, so if you um, try and do the tail grab later in the season, it doesn't always work. So it's probably also a pheromonal thing. So when they're in that mating season, you can you can do that tail grab and they'll like they'll just sort of turn around and be like, what are you? They are pretty doping. They've got very small eyes. And you know, I, I don't think much tries to attack them when they're big. Um, but yeah, certainly if they don't want it, they will you can't hold on to them. They're super strong. Uh, it's just a, a case of that, yeah, if they seem to be oblivious when um when we do get them to the surface and they realize something's going on then you need another person to grab them and stop them from swimming away yeah great um zoe has said it's mentioned they go to the surface a fair bit is there a diurnal pattern to it oh don't know um yeah great question so juveniles are often well they're not ever often seen but i so one of my colleagues who was up at James Cook University would go out at night time to catch sea snakes um, in Cleveland Bay. And he would he came across juveniles multiple times when he was in the in Cleveland Bay doing that work. So that was that was during the night. Um, with the adults of southern Queensland, they're um, certainly seen during the day. But yeah, with the night time, um, we've we've actually just got some pretty uh, great um, research happening. We've got access to drone footage being taken by the surf lifesavers um, up and down the coast in southern Queensland. So they run drones um, on the surf beaches uh, during school holidays and on weekends. And um, this is going to be pretty exciting to have a look at. And they see leopard sharks on the surface a lot. Oh. So, um, but they're not running them at night time. So uh, we would need to have special types of tags, but we yeah we haven't really used the satellite tags on leopards um so much a bit expensive so i don't know if anyone wants to sponsor some go for your life if you know <laughs> anyone who wants to sponsor some send them our way we'll put them on um okay that's great um but julian also wants to know do they have ectoparasites i think julian can answer that one <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to answer that one, Julian? Is it wouldn't a leech be an ectoparasite? It is, but I was thinking of all I want. <laughs> we collected a whole bunch of these very cute little copy pods off the noses of the um, uh, leopards uh, during November for Ju Julian's research to identify the species. And I think we probably you you said we're getting close to getting some results for that, right? Yes, uh, it could be probably a new species, but um, like like we said, always in research, more research needs to be done. I <laughs> say <laughs> so you want funds too, hey? Right? <laughs> well, actually, it's good, and and one of the questions is for us is is about populations. Like now that we know, I mean, the population geographically is quite limited, and and it will be interesting to see if actually the the distribution of those parasites is similar. Um, so it's just the beginning of, of more um, research, I guess. But thank you, Chris. <laughs> uh, Marie would like to know, do we have them at Perigian Beach near Noosa? Um, they would go past there, uh, certainly, because that would be part of their migration. I don't know if they really spend much time hanging around there. So, um, but they, when they are on the move, sometimes it seems that they move on the surface, but uh, certainly 
you might find them more on the slightly deeper reef rather than in the in the surf zone. Yeah. Yeah, well I can't say we've sort of seen them in all the diving we do here on our our reefs. I see them at Wolf Rock. So yeah. I don't know how again quite in what numbers. Um we we do get them off uh you know, southern uh, southern GBR, so Lady Elliot, uh, we get them around there. Um, but yeah, certainly nothing like in the densities that we get in southern Queensland or off off um, Strati. Yeah. Okay, so I think we've run out of questions now. <laughs> There's a lot of good um, questions. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. So that was really amazing. Um, I know I learned a lot. So I'm sure everybody else did, or rather, may have just raised a lot more questions. Um, so I'd like to thank you for, oh, hang on. Stephen's now asked, um, how did Derek's tag migrate out? Yeah, so the tags will just move out from the basically force of, of moving through the water column. So the, the tag, it becomes heavier without fouling. And over time, you know, there's just going to be a push towards the back of the fin because of the shark moving forward. And we've seen that with quite a lot of um, those old tags. So uh, we did have one animal. We saw one of the tagged animals that there was so much fouling, the whole fin was bent quite oh. over. Um, but then we saw her again and the tag had, had moved out. So the weight of the tag itself will pull the tag out and and fortunately these animals heal really well so um yeah that's uh but otherwise um you know we, we're really trying to move away from having external tags on animals if we can particularly things that are long term so with our manta ray research we we have been putting external tags on but they will they will disconnect um within a few months so they're not they're not permanent tags. Okay, well, thank you very much. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. okay. So everyone's just saying thank you. So, <laughs> um, thank so you. that's great. So I just let everyone know too that um, this has been recorded, so it will be going up on YouTube in a few days' time. So if you want to go back and um, Thanks, really. catch up on all again on the things you might have missed out on, and Rebecca says woohoo for jaguar sharks. Um, so we might end it there and thank you everybody for coming along and joining us tonight and thank you so much Christine. My pleasure.